so our last uh, modulation scheme is AM, large carrier. So there's two different configurations we're going to take a look at. Uh, the first one, which is coherent detection, and the second one is using an envelope detector. And the envelope detector, I won't go into too much. The math is very involved, but I put it there just for completeness. Okay? So this analysis is very much in the same line as what we've seen for double sideband and single sideband sparse carrier. All right, so let's just go through some notation first. Uh, so let's consider the coherent detection scheme first. So we've got uh, S of T, which is basically the uh, modulated signal. So what's happening is that uh, this here, yeah, so S of T would be right at this point. So what's going to happen is that you're going to have uh, the amplitude modulation is basically adding a DC offset to your message, and then you're going to have a carrier added on top of that. So that would be the uh, S of T. And then X of T is just the noise added, and then you're going to have a bandpass filter because when you are doing amplitude modulation, the only difference is that uh, you're going to have an impulse that's centered at the carrier frequency. So you're still going to need a bandpass filter to not only get the, you know, the modulated signal, but to be able to filter out as much noise as possible with the bandwidth that is centered at uh, omega C or F of C and spanning you know, plus minus B. And then you have a bandpass, you have a baseband filter or a low pass filter at the end here so that you are uh, performing uh, your coherent detection, so you're pretty much removing all the sidebands except for the low pass component. That's when you put it through your uh, modulator with the, you know, close again, and then you have a DC block to get rid of the DC offset so that you're left with the original message signal. Okay, and also each modulator has a gain of root 2 to make the math simpler. Okay, so the only difference between the double side brand and this configuration is that you have a DC offset to add the carrier on top, and then you also have a DC block to get rid of the offset one, and then getting the message when you're done. Okay, so we're going to pretty much go through the same analysis as we did in the past. So the first step would be to take your message, uh, add it with a DC offset, and then multiply by your cosine to do the modulation. So inside the transmitter, this is what would be your S of T. And then once you transmit it through the channel, you have your noise added on top, and this is what you get. So it's just S of T, which is this guy over here, just adding your noise on top. And then uh, the next step would be to uh, put your signal through the bandpass filter. Remember, you're trying to remove as much noise as possible, but at the same time, uh, the noise that is spanning within the boundaries of your bandpass filter, unfortunately, will leak through. But you're trying to eliminate as much noise as possible. So when you put it through your bandpass filter, remember that this component is your amplitude modulated uh, large, you know, large carrier uh, you know, uh, modulation scheme. And when you put it through your bandpass filter, then this obviously is going to pass through because this signal spans the bandwidth or the, uh, the uh, bandpass characteristics of your bandpass filter. But then what's going to happen is that when you, with the AWGN noise model, this noisy signal, when you pass it through your bandpass filter, it splits up into two quadrature components. Okay, so that's what's happening over there. So, so this is the uh, formula that we saw from previously. So the first term is basically your signal component. It's going to be centered on omega C, because, and then you're adding an offset because of the carrier. And then when you put it through your bandpass filter, this pretty much stays the same. It's going to pass through your bandpass filter. All right, so that applying a bandpass filter certainly has no effect there. The, the last two terms are your noise components. They get split up into quadrature components because you're putting it through your bandpass filters. So that is what is known uh, with, uh, in terms of bandpass filters. So the next step here is to calculate the signal power and the noise power that is going in uh, or into the receiver from the channel. All right. So all you have to do here is calculate the expected value of your signal input signal squared. So when you do that, you the root two becomes two, and then this component gets squared, and then the cosine gets squared as well. If you remember what cosine squared was, it's basically a half and then one plus cos of two. So we represent that here. So you're going to have the 2 and the half will cancel, so this becomes 1 plus cos of 2, and then you're going to get a plus m of t squared plus a plus m of t squared cos 2 because of the splitting of the, uh, you know, without the cos and with the cos of 2 omega c. And then this second term here, it evaluates to 0 because remember the average value of your message is 0. So if you're integrating over a period of time right, with the average value, it's simply going to be 0. So this goes to 0, then what you're left with is this term. So when you expand this out, you get a squared, 2a m t, and m squared of t. So you can actually find the expected value for each of these. The second term goes away because remember the average value of m of t is zero. So all you're left with is expected value of a squared plus the expected value of your message squared. So the expected value of a constant is just simply the constant of itself. Remember the average value of five is going to be five or the expected value of five is going to be five. And the expected value of a constant would 
obviously will be the constant. So the expected value of a squared, which is simply being a squared, and the expected value of the mean value squared of your message is simply whatever the message power would be. So if you're taking a look at the input uh, signal power, when you're taking a look at amplitude modulation, it's simply the message power by itself, and then added with the carrier amplitude squared. So that's the only difference. So what we're going to do now is we're going to calculate the noise power. So remember, you're putting your AWGN noise model through a bandpass filter. And when you do that, it be, looks like this. Remember, you have a flat height of N0 over 2 for all frequencies. And you put a bandpass filter on that noise process, you're going to represent it in terms of its bandpass component. So everything is 0 except for the bandwidth uh, configurations for that bandpass filter. So if you want to figure out what the noise power would be, it's simple. All you have to do is just calculate the area for both, for both of them. So remember, it's width times height. So if you want to take a look in terms of omega, the width here is 4 pi b. The height is n0 over 2. And then you're doing the same thing here on the right side. So two of these are the same because both of these have exactly the same width and height. So you're just adding these two areas together. And then you have to make sure you divide by 2 pi because uh, the omega asks you to divide by 2 pi. So when you add these two things together, you get n0 4 pi b. And then the 4 and the 2 cancels to a 2. And the pi's cancel, so you get n0 b. If you want to do it in the same way in terms of frequency or hertz, it's very simple. The width instead will be 2b, the height will be n0 over 2. And then you have two of these, so when you add these together, you still get the same amount. It's 2n0b. Okay? Because the twos for both of these fractions cancel. When you add those things up, you get that. So the next part here would be to take a look at what the output signal will be. So once you have your input signal after, you know, um, you know, right before you're through the receiver, you multiply by, you know, omega, you know, root 2 cos, and then you put it through a low-pass filter, and that's what's happening here. So remember, y i of t was this signal over here. So it's this thing here. So you're going to take this, and you're going to multiply by root 2 cos omega ct. And that's what's happening over here. So root 2 and the root 2s become 2. So you have a plus mt cos squared. And then you're also going to have quadrature components. You have nc cos. So that, that cos becomes cos squared. And then you have ns sine. So that's what's happening over here as well. And then if you use trig identities, so if you remember, cos squared is a half, 1 plus cos 2. And 2 sine cos becomes sine of 2. And then you can divide by 2 to make this a half. When you do those substitutions, this is what you get. So we will first um, factor a cos. So this cos squared will factor into, you know, you know, will form a factor. We'll factor out a 2. So in that case, you get a plus m of t over here. And then when you factor out a 2, you have to divide by 2 to make things even. So root 2 divided by 2 is 1 over root 2. And then you have this nc term over here. And then we replace cosine with a half. And then root 2 divided by 2, it would be 1 over root 2. So when you push it through your low-pass filter, this is going to go away. And then you also have a bunch of things that are going to go away as well. And this is what you get. So this is what we had before. And then we changed cos squared to 1 plus cos 2. And that splits up into this over here. So these two terms cancel because you have a low-pass filter. And then when you finally have a DC block as well, this A term goes away. So you're left with this instead. So you have, actually, oh, that's a mistake here. So get rid of that A. Uh, this should just be M of T by itself. I, I apologize for that. So we should actually get rid of this. So get rid of the actual A by itself. All right? Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, apologies for that. So get rid of this. It's just uh, M of T. Okay, so uh, remove this, it's just, it's just m of t and 1 over root 2. So I'm going to correct these slides later, but after the DC block, there is no a term. So remove that. It's just m of t as a signal component and 1 over root 2 and c of t as the noise component because that's what's remaining over here. So remember to remove this a, I'll correct the slides and repost them. So if you wanted to find the, uh, you know, the signal power, Okay, so what's happening here is you, you know, get rid of this. So it's just E of M of T, which is just your message signal power. Okay, so remember to get rid of this A. So it's just E of M squared of T, and then that's just simply equal to the message power. Okay, and then if you want to do it for the uh, noise power, it's very simple. You just take this, and then you uh, multiply it, you know, you multiply by itself, you square it. So the 1 over root 2 becomes 2, and then when you square this, it becomes NC squared. And then you can bring the half on the outside. The expected value of the noise, the cosine quadrature, is just simply equal to the input signal power itself. And then it's just equal to N0B, because this quantity is 2N0B from before. So I'd like to stress that the signal power here is, um, let's see here, it, was, it would just be the input signal power. OK, uh, let's see here. Uh, yep, OK, so this is good. So 
Okay, so because the output signal power is just S of m, right, so what we need to do now is we have to figure out what the ratio is. So the signal to noise ratio is simply S of m divided by sigma, sigma, zero, you know, sigma zero squared, which is n zero b. That's what we have. And then what we can actually do, we can actually do a little bit of mathematical uh, manipulation. So what we can do is we can actually multiply to the top by the input signal power divided by the bottom. So when you do this, this is actually equal to gamma, all right? And then if I have SM divided by SI, the input signal power is A squared plus S of M, if you remember from before. So the reason why I'm doing this is I'm going to show you a little bit of a consequence and when you're actually using amplitude modulation. But uh, so this is just for manipulation, but there's a purpose for this. So remember that if you want to do amplitude modulation large carrier, you have to make sure that the carrier has to be bigger than the largest value of your message to make sure that uh, you can use an envelope detector, right? So this means that as you make the, so this means that uh, the maximum signal to noise ratio that you'll ever get is when the carrier is equal to the peak of the message. Anything less than that, you will get a smaller signal to noise ratio. So this is the largest possible signal to noise ratio that you'll ever get. So you'll substitute the carrier to be whatever the peak of the message is. So this is your signal to noise ratio. I just moved the gamma to the left side so I can show you that you want to evaluate A at M of P. So then what you'll do is you'll substitute M of P squared here, and then I divide top and bottom by S of SM, which is the message powers, which is what you get here. So if I let T be M P squared over S of M, right, if you actually use the thing above, this means that the value of T can only be bigger than or equal to 1 to ensure that the this is well respected, so you can actually make this so that you can use an envelope detector. Right? So this means that if you replace this quantity with t, what this means is that uh, <coughs> t can only be bigger than 1. So that means that if t can be 1 or more, this means that the largest signal to noise ratio you'll get is basically gamma over 2. <coughs> and anything bigger than 1 is going to be less than that. So the implications of this are, are quite serious. So if you transform this into decibels, what's going to happen is that the signal to noise ratio will only be, you know, so you're going to take um, 10 to the log 10 of this, and then what you do is you can split this up because if you have a um, product of two values for the logarithm, you can split this up into log of A plus log of B or log of the first value plus log of the second value. So this, you can think of this as gamma times 1 over 2, and when you do that, 10 to log 10 of 0.5 is actually minus 3 dB. So what this tells us here is that if you use amplitude modulation, the actual performance characteristic and actually performs up to three decibels worse. So, um, you're, so if you actually use amplitude modulation, the performance is actually going to be less, but up to a maximum of three decibels worse than either double sideband, single sideband, or baseband systems. Okay. I've only got three more slides, and then we'll take another mini break, and then I'll do the I'll start the tutorial after. So hopefully we can get out of here early. So this is the last configuration we're going to talk about. So this is where we're actually going to use an envelope detector. Instead of using a coherent demodulation scheme, we're going to use an envelope detector instead. So here are some points that I want to summarize from the previous, uh, previous few slides. So the input signal power is A squared plus S of M, right, from before. And then the input signal that's going into the uh, receiver end it was this that we calculated from before. So if you remember the envelope detector, the math behind it, uh, what you do is you split it up so that you have a sum of cos terms and a sum of sine terms. So the first of these, you can group these, you can factor out a cos, so you have root 2 a plus m of t plus n c of t. So that would be the cosine term, and then you have a sine term for n of s. So if you wanted to actually find the envelope, all you have to do is figure out what the coefficients for the cos term is, you square that. For the sine term, you square that. So this term, you know, the coefficient that is in front of the cos, you know, when you factor these together, we're going to let that be a. And then the coefficient that is in front of the sign will let that be b. So if you want to use an envelope detector, you have to find the magnitude and phase so that you can actually. So the magnitude would just simply be defined as the envelope itself. So it's, you know, this is the cosine term, that's the sine term. And then the angle, you know, the phase would be just arc 10 will be over a. But this, this is something I just wanted to cover. Like you're not expected to know this for the final exam. It's just I wanted to make this complete because I'm, I want to cover both schemes. So here are two cases. The first case is when you have very small noise in the envelope detector. If that's the case, then what's going to happen is that this term, if you have very small noise, this term is going to dominate over this term. So you can think of this term, the, uh, the sine quadrature component, to be approximately 0. So if that's the case, then what's going to happen is that your envelope will simply be this by itself, because when you take the square root of a squared, you simply get this term. That's what's happening here. And then when you apply the DC block, 
yeah, this is a mistake again. So this should actually, you should remove the A, so it should be root two M of T and then plus N C of T. Okay, so there's, there's a mistake. I'll, I'll correct that, then I'll post the right slides online. But um, this should be root two M of T and then plus N C of T. So that's after the DC block. So if you wanted to calculate the signal to noise ratio, just repeat the previous procedure and you're gonna get, uh, you're gonna see that the SNR will match the first configuration with the uh, coherent detection scheme. And then the second case is if you have very large noise. If you have very large noise, what's gonna happen is that this term, the cosine term, will actually be less than the sine term. So what's gonna happen is that you're gonna have noise that actually dominates your entire, the modulated signal. So there's actually no way you can actually get the original signal back if you used envelope detection if your noise is very, very predominant. So the long story short is that the envelope detector is not going to work for large noise. It'll work for noise that is very small, but for very large noises of high amplitudes, then unfortunately it's not going to work. Okay? And that's actually it. That's all I have for the course. So we'll take, uh, we'll take a, just a five-minute break because, uh, you know, it's actually too soon to take a break. So I'm going to take a five-minute break so I can set up my tablet, and then we'll start the tutorial, and then I'll, be, I'll try to finish up by hopefully eight 8.15 the latest, okay? So we'll take a little break and then we'll come back and start the tutorial.